Welcome to the Startup Grind. Woo! Tell me, tell me just a few things about you know, early on. You know, where'd you grow mm -hmm. up? Okay. You know, what did your parents do? I have to admit I'm a little bit of an odd duck. Um, so I was, um, uh, I, I basically grew up, the short story is that I, you know, convenient cocktail party version is that I grew up in Seattle. Um, but uh, I sort of come from a weird background. My mother was a single mom and uh, really couldn't take care of me. Uh, uh, and we were in Brooklyn. And, uh, and so when I was about three years old, she sent me to, and I was a handful. Uh, uh, so. Uh, she sent me to live with my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, um, uh, in Hong Kong. So it was a huge culture shock for me to go there. And then I lived with them actually for a much longer period of time than I think anybody had anticipated. And so I came back to the United States when I was about nine. And again, had a different form of culture shock. Um, uh, and that was when I came to Seattle. And so, so um, you know, I think early on my experiences sort of comprised of... Uh, sort of don't let people write you off, uh, number one. And number two, uh, uh, there, there's, there's, you can sort of create some alchemy sometimes if you take things that aren't meant to be put together and you put them together, whether they're cultural sort of norms or, or ways of thinking about problem solving. Um, uh, it, I, I, I very much value diversity in, in thought and opinion and backgrounds uh, on my various startup teams. So. I don't know if that's where you're getting at. Really yeah. and, and you kind of answered that. But what do you think is an advantage you got from that kind of background upbringing? I mean, two cold, that's, that's pretty unique. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, I should, I should add that I was actually at the age of nine, my mom uh, married uh, a, a really nice uh, Italian American guy uh, who legally adopted me. So I had that those influences as well. So I was really like the only Chinese kid in Edmonds, Washington, <laughs> with an Italian grandmother. So, uh, 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 and so, so uh, I think, I think, yeah, I think it was really about um, just uh, uh, it's okay to be open to different ideas and that different people have different approaches to um, looking at the world uh, and uh, and understanding. You know, just taking leadership as an example, um, the sort of more American style of leadership, what, even what's going on right now in the election, and you kind of see the, the stagecraft that, that the candidates are going through. Like we, we value very highly for people to be assertive and they're quick, and they're, you know, uh, type A, right? Um, but 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 more in Asian culture, really the, the person that is sort of the more revered leader, if you will, is the person who's the listener. You know, the person that hangs back and. And there's a sense that that person is the most secure person in the room, right? So, so even just sort of absorbing some of that stuff from the various uh, like parents and grandparents was, was an interesting influencing uh, factor on me. So, and that probably helps when you're obviously building teams. Yeah, you're dealing with some diverse. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, what do you want to be when you're growing up? Gosh. Um, Astronaut. Yeah, that was one. That was totally one. That was totally one. And then, uh, absolutely, that was one. I mean, uh, 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 I, I knew I knew what it wasn't going to be like, you know, some sports athlete or something like that. And I didn't have a whole lot of other, you know. But yeah, astronaut was definitely one. Um, uh, and then I think uh, we, we, you and I are the same age, I think. And uh, I, in fact, I, I, I'm going to bet that I'm older than you are. <laughs> so. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> Let's see, let's see the driver's license. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I think, you know, I, I might have been like, I think I was like 13 or 14 years old. 13, I think, when, when my dad brought home an Apple II computer and I started plinking and teaching myself how to um, um, uh, uh, write code. And that's really how I got started in the industry. But I remember just kind of like sort of understanding about Steve Jobs for the first time uh, at that point. Or, or I'd be like, you know, uh, 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 playing a computer game, and you would see like a full-page ad in Byte Magazine. Uh, I don't know if you know, people remember Byte Magazine, but 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 there'd be there'd be a full-page ad taken out by somebody like Trip Hawkins, who was at the time the CEO of Electronic Arts, the big games company. They were pretty coming up and becoming a pretty big brand name at that point, but not certainly the multi-billion-dollar company that they are today. But I remember sort of thinking gosh, you can be the sort of renaissance guy. You can be somebody who's really very strong on the engineering side. Um, um, 
and, and also understand design and some of the emo aspects of emotional design and how to mm -hmm. really reach users in a way that's more emotional. Um, and at the same time, you could be um, uh, sort of a, even a triple threat and really understand business and be that you know charismatic keynote speaker that gets people to you know understand why your product is great. So so I, I had some of those folks as heroes, um, but the truth is I was pretty random and was pretty non-directed uh, yeah. as I was growing up. So. Did you enjoy golf? I did. I loved it. Yeah. yeah. I, I went to Whitman. And, and the truthful answer is that every Ivy League school that I applied to, I was turned down uh, by. So I think I was waitlisted by by one of them, and I didn't know better than to, to, like, so if I just waited. Now, Whitman is in Walla Walla. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah. So for you people who don't know, Whitman's in Walla Walla. I, I replaced Walla Walla because I'm a huge oh, wine fan. So you're, I'm a big wine fan. We'll talk about that. Yeah, so. yeah. So, after, uh, we, after we talk about your nonprofit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, so uh, Whitman's great school. It, it was great. It was great. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, it was sort of my. Um, I, I think I was, had a shotgun approach. I, I don't know how many applications I did. Probably like eight of them or something. And Whitman was sort of uh, uh, one of the ones that I hoped to also get into. And, and, uh, what did you do for fun in college? In college, I don't think I can talk about. <laughs> I, you, know, I had a, you know, I was a typical college guy. You know, I just. Um, well, you're in well, Walla Walla, so it's not that. Yeah, big. yeah, no, exactly. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, we, you know, I think I really like the socialization aspect of just getting to know a lot of kids, and and there were, uh, frankly, uh, students there uh, from just uh, the, the the kinds of kids that I I never imagined uh, I would meet. You know, there'd be like some kids from Eastern Washington that that they, they, they were, were farmer. farmer. Yeah, they grew up on a farm. I never met somebody who grew up on a farm, and you know they're. You know, wicked smart in physics class or in philosophy, and I'm like, okay, so that that kind of changes my worldview about you know what it's like to grow up on a farm or something. Um, so uh, you're probably thinking of the same thing about something. Yeah. <laughs> what what uh, what's who's your best boss? Gosh, um, there are several that that I would, uh, 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 and there's actually kind of a pattern there. Um, uh, so really, more question, the more important question is why. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So one of my best bosses uh, was a woman by the name of Charlotte Guyman, who is currently on the board of Berkshire Hathaway. But before she was on the board of Berkshire Hathaway, she was um, a general manager at Microsoft, and uh, and I had the privilege of working uh, for her when I was a young up and comer at Microsoft. I was in my early twenties, and I'd never met a woman who was so. You know, I earlier I referenced being a triple threat, but she was like, you know, quadruple, a quint, you know, a tuple threat. Uh, where, where she was just good at, she, she had so much range. She was good with technology, great product sensibility, awesome with people. Um, you know, I would see her. Uh, uh, you know, we're about to give a presentation somewhere in front of hundreds of people, like maybe a thousand people in the division, and it's something that she had just gotten briefed on for. 30 seconds right before walking on stage and and I've been studying it like all week right we get on stage and she nails her marks and I you know and and, and I've just never seen anybody operate at that level um, and be so good and I would you know we would have these meetings that for a young 20 something kind of scary uh, uh, to, to meet with Bill Gates you know and get potentially beat up because you, you haven't thought through your strategy well enough and she would hand Bill just beautifully right and there were other things in the room. Probably I was too young and inexperienced to even be privy to whatever politics across the different vice presidents. She she just she just had a way about her that was great. And uh, so I learned. I would say I learned uh, the most from her. Another great boss was um, uh, Lisa Brummel, uh, who is uh, currently sort of there. yeah one of the owners of the Seattle Storm. And and uh, but but uh, she was also like a general manager running the works group. At, at one point, and she, I, I really valued how just uh, two things I remember about Lisa. Uh, one was how fair she was all the time, and she had a way of distilling down very complicated issues into simple language. You know, she didn't she didn't try to sound super smart by by using fancy words. It was always like, you know what? There's something about that that doesn't pass the sniff test, so I don't like it. Let's not do that, right? And then we accepted that, and that was fine. Uh, so then the second thing I remember about her was that um, every afternoon, it didn't matter if something was on fire, uh, some major crisis, 
5 o'clock or 5.15, somewhere around there, she would grab her gym bag, and you could be mid-sentence trying to, you know, she'd be like, sorry, got to go. <laughs> got to go home to, to my spouse and, and kid. So I thought that was great. Yeah, like work-life balance, which is unusual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I have to ask you for some feedback, Michael. Am I going long on my answer? Sure. What's the chunk size like? Oh, yeah. uh, you're good. Okay. 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 Do you I have should. mentees? I'm gonna find one tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you have mentees? I do, yes. uh, and um, uh, but but uh, but I'm not exaggerating when I say that I really learn more from them. There's there's a, just a lot going on in the world with, with folks younger than myself that sometimes that I get exposed to. It's so so tell tell us just what was the original idea or goal behind picking? Right, so right. Just give us a short snip. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what so, was so, and don't, that's right. So you have to rewind a clock back. Um, at this point, I think uh, six, seven years now. And so, so there wasn't as much talk about you know apps and, and the cloud and cloud applications and all of that stuff. So, so really, the idea was um, uh, there were two ideas converged all at once. And in my, but my, I had two other business partners who were technical visionaries, and uh, Darren Messina and Mike Harrington. Mike Harrington was a co-founder of Valve, uh, and Darren, who was uh, uh, quite a, uh, he was a distinguished engineer at Microsoft. And the three of us actually knew each other, going back to, I knew Darren when I was about 18 years old, when we were some teenagers. Uh, Mike, I kind of knew that he was friends with Darren. Anyway, point is that um, two, two sort of veins converge, and I think sometimes this can happen with startups. Um, they had the idea that there was a sea change going on um, in, in, in the world with what was happening uh, with things like Flash, uh, what was happening with Flash 8, jump to Flash 9, the imminent you know, move to 10, and how much ground that was going to move. That's something interesting. You could get some really dynamic, robust experiences to happen inside of a browser, right? So then, so then, uh, and I'm really, I'm, I'm not really an engineer. I'm a product manager. So then, I get excited about things like, well, what could that be? Like, what are the things that are kind of complicated that you have to, you know? You're, you're, I'm all about uh, with all my startups. Maybe a common theme is that it's about um, uh, reducing gaps or seams between things. If you don't have to go down to the mouse over down to the start menu. Now with Windows 8 here, whatever it is you do, hit some place and something starts. Uh, uh, if you don't have to go do that and then find the list of applications and then launch it, and then and then maybe you had to have it, had to have installed it in the first place and go through a complicated installation process, which you would do, you still do with things like Adobe, uh, uh, the Photoshop or Photoshop Elements. If you can bypass all of that stuff, you win, right? Because people are fundamentally wanting to just beeline and take a direct. Uh, line from A to B to the prop here. I have a problem. I need to solve that problem. So if you can shorten that gap. Uh, it's a great thing. So so then so I was coming from the perspective of here. I had a co multiple things here. I, I think I had, we my wife and I had a copy of uh, Photoshop Elements that we paid probably uh, we we didn't have a coupon for it. So I think we paid full price. I think it's like 70, yeah. 80 bucks or something like that. Yeah. yeah and, and 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 my wife is very smart. She's very tech savvy. It was sitting there on a shelf gathering dust because it was even, even Photoshop elements. I'm not talking Photoshop, like it was a professional but Photoshop elements. It was too cumbersome and complex and had a manual, and, and, she, and she couldn't figure it out. She was like, do you know how to? And I'm like, you know, I, th those days are you know, uh, 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 long gone for me. That I, you know, I remember using uh, other uh, uh, products, like Corel products, but I never really learned from them. So, so it, it, then it dawned on me that, that my gosh, if you could, the intersection was, um, things really rich and dynamic and interactive that you can then do in a browser that you don't need to download. And oh my God, if you can make the act of photo editing, which is something that everybody needs to do, if you can make that really easy, then that's going to be uh, huge. And, and it was a 
a sort of a we also thought about this aspect of any time that there's a platform change or a technology change, um, you can unseat the, the, the entrenched uh, incumbent. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And over the course of two, three years, uh, uh, we, we, could, uh, we could say that numerically, um, the number of picnic users, whether it's people who registered for the product or people who were guest users who, who used it to uh, do something with their photos, um, it, it's, it's just an astronomically huge number that blows away the lifetime sales of any uh, Photoshop Adobe product. So, so it became the world's most popular photo editor. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 The last thing you said. What was that? Popular photo editor. I think it's. Wow. It, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Is this is the picnic that's integrated in Picasa? Still, what you built, or is yeah, it uh, so, so yeah, so so the uh, there's a, there's a, there's a creative kit that's been integrated into Google Plus, uh, and you're right, uh, there was a an instantiation of Picnic, and that core technology that was integrated into Picasa Web, um, uh, or and a Picasa client product after Google bought Picnic, um, but. I honestly have lost track of, I know that the first is still true, that that still exists, but I don't know if the second still exists. You know, they have version upgrades and things like that, and they could, I, I don't know if the, the thing that you're asking about is still in there. I hope it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, I'll, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Give me like half hour. <laughs> I, got, I got two questions I, wanna, I, get, I have to get through. Um, so, give me a uh, it's a startup. Uh -huh. You had challenges. It yep. wasn't all rosy. Right. Uh, none of them are. No. So, <laughs> so give me one of the challenges you had uh, during picnic that you were like, holy crap, this was this is this is a pretty big deal, and we didn't know yeah. how we were get through it. We got through it. Give, oh give me my one gosh, of those. where do I start? There, there were so many. Of them. Yeah, yeah. Give, give you just one. Yeah, uh, one. One. Uh, um, one. I guess the one that I remember the most. Um, is uh, and I think this I'll pick the one that where I think it's universal and I think that anybody doing a startup would run up against it, regardless of how you're capitalized and whether you're taking angel money or VC money. I think it's Can you speak up please? Okay, you got it. It's hard to uh, right here. Okay, no problem, no problem. Um, is the partnership or the ownership group being in complete alignment about what to do, what the right outcome is. And there are times when, when there truly is no single right answer, right? So say, I'm just going to make up something. Uh, 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 you're, you're 18 months into it. Somebody comes by and makes you an offer. Uh, and you know what? This is awesome. We love it. We love your, your tr track record and your growth. We love your engineering talent. We're going to buy your company for $20 million. Wow, sounds great. $20 million. That's awesome. But perhaps there's also another right answer, which is, well, we think that we can grow this thing a little bit more. We think that maybe it's really not a $20 million company, maybe it's a $40 million company, maybe it's a $60 million. So, so, so then how do you handle that when there's no really one right answer? And that kind of uh, conflict resolution, uh, I, I, I personally found to be my biggest challenge as the CEO of, 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 of Picnic. I mean, you know, my business partners are great guys. Um, but like I said earlier, different people have different approaches to, to how they look at problems. Engineers have a tendency to look at problems and say there's one right answer. That's it. And we can somehow, if we modeled out where our growth trajectory would be, if we assume that we can sign up a few more of these major partnerships, and then we can think that our conversion rate on our premium product is X, then the amount of revenue, our revenue run rate in year four and five would look like Z, right? Uh, or you can say, you know, you don't you, know, you don't know. You don't know. And, and so, so then sometimes then the right answer depends on a set of different factors. So, so I, I would then posit that, that really if, you're, if your conflict resolution skills or um, uh, problem solving skills are, if, you know, those really come into play uh, uh, at times like that. And so I would posit that those are the kinds of challenges that we're going to We've all, I mean, most of us had partners or have partners. So, with your partners, yeah. um, you know, 
was that something that you would say, I would totally go through it with those, those two guys again, or wow, I wish I would have I wish I would have tweaked it earlier on to bring in a third party or reduce it to two or whatever. Right, so right. Oh, yeah, I, I, see, I see your question. Well, I should first say, I should turn the tables a bit. And really, it's, it's, it's not a matter of whether I would uh, do a company with those guys again. It's more like, would they do a company okay, with me again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, so, uh, just to be clear, uh, they're great guys uh, and they uh, are super smart. Um, uh, I will say that my experience teaches me, uh, to, or it, it causes me to say the following thing, which is that um, uh, the same, I think you almost have to apply a greater degree of thoughtfulness and rigor and um, uh, uh, scrutiny uh, to, to it, how you pick a business partner needs to be every bit as much as, uh, 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 as how you pick a spouse. Because it is like that. You're married to them. And, um, and I think um, Yeah, you just just how you deal with issues, all of that stuff, and you know, and, and it's also also part of my answer is is really just uh, uh, how one, um, uh, you know, it's also the, the phase in your life too. I think I'm a very different kind of entrepreneur um, today I than I was five years ago. You know, maybe my I'm a little bit more mellow about certain things. You've had now. a child. Yeah. You've had a child. I've had a child. Yeah, that, that, that mellows me out. <laughs> that yeah. Changes. And, uh, so, um, a different, you know, yeah, yeah, so. Um, can we build on that? I actually have a question. Okay. Yeah, I think it's email, I mean, it's glossed over a lot. What, what are the ways that you go about your dating? Yeah, I think that's a tough one. I, th I think that, I think that's a really great question. I, th I think it's tough to, I think it, just like, um, I'm wondering if this is a true statement. I, it, you sort of just like uh, being married. I, I think you really don't know what someone's going to be like until you're married to them for, until you're really there, until you've been married for, you know, 10 years. And, uh, but but uh, to, to get to get at the spirit of what you're saying, I think um, um, it helps if you've worked with that person before. I think that's a that's a big one. But even so, that's not a, uh, a free pass that, that it's all going to be smooth because because what really happens is that when you are so invested in something it's different from being co-workers with somebody yeah. you know working with somebody at Amazon or Google or Microsoft or wherever you are um, uh, at the end of the day you're both you both of you guys are still getting a paycheck and etc but but when it's kind of your money or it's also the other person's money or uh, I think the values have to be very much in alignment so so my simple sort of simplistic answer is just get to know them as, as, as well as possible. It's, it's really about values alignment and how you resolve a conflict. Those are the things that, you know, I, I know people, you know, I know uh, uh, some, well, I should name names, uh, uh, not that it's bad, but, but maybe they, they, they would say it differently, but, but I know some of my colleagues who are also startup CEOs and co-founders that they would, they, 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 they sort of go through a phase where, you know what, the next one, I don't, I'm always the, um, Majority owner 51%. or the fifty-one percent, they they insist on that. Uh, just to, and there's some, you know, there's some something, you know, uh, uh, there's something uh, elegant about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, right. It's done. The deal. End of discussion. <laughs> what? Uh, um, now I'll skip. I'll come back to that. Tell us about Sun Google. Tell us uh, how how that happened. Number one, they just the phone and somebody call you and say, hey. Jonathan, there. I see you have a really cool company. So things work pretty well. The right. I would say, that happen. Yeah, yeah. I would say both times you you work the problem. Uh, they don't pick up the phone and just uh, call you. Oh, I, I've never been that lucky. Maybe who knows? Maybe Instagram was like Zuckerberg just called up Kevin and just you know, hey, billions sound good. Um, so, uh, but, but in my case, I have to work a little harder. Uh, uh, so, so in the first case, uh, it was very much. Well, in both cases, serendipity played a big part, and that's why I say that I'm. It's, it's, I'm more lucky than good, truly. Um, so in the first case, a, an ex-colleague of mine from my Microsoft days, um, I had heard that she had gone to work at Google. And I, I literally I just lost touch with her. And, and I just remember that in meetings, she was awesome, she was smart, et cetera. And, I, and she came up to Seattle, and she was having um, um, a brunch somewhere where I was having brunch. And just on my way to the men's room, I saw her, and I'm like, 
Katie, my God, I haven't seen you in like two years. How have you been? Like, what are you doing? And she tells him what she's doing. And I'm like, that sounds like it's related to this startup that I'm doing. But I didn't push it at that point. I just go, you know what, let's just exchange business cards. Um, a few weeks later, I thought about her again. I go, I really should send her something. And so I sent her the, the deck that I had usually prepared. And I said, Katie, you know what, I, I'd love like 15 minutes of your time. I'm going to send you this deck. Can I just walk you through it? And she was delighted to you know, uh, do that. She, I was really grateful to her that she made her time. She could have blown me off. And so we sat, and I talk, walked her through, uh, and that was Fat Bits. Um, it's about P-H-A-T. Um, uh, and that ended up becoming Google Gadgets and their desktop sidebar at a time when Google was sort of doing the opposite of Microsoft. Google was very much about, we own the internet. Now we're trying to get onto people's desktops. right? So Fatbits were these little mini XML uh, applications. It was actually a platform, an authoring platform for building these, plat these gadgets on the people's, uh, uh, on, on uh, folks' desktops. So, so any of that, uh, uh, sh sh it was not in fact related to what she was doing. And so, um, but she goes, you know what? I, I, I think this is kind of like what my friend over here is doing. And so she sent the deck forward with, I think, a positive, like, hey, this guy's cool. You know, he's not, he's not a bozo. He's, he's pretty smart. Um, and uh, and then, and that's when um, I got an email to go down the Mountain View to talk with some of the product people down there. So, so they had uh, talked. They had already talked about it. Right, right, right. And and picnic was a little bit more, I'd say, convoluted. So I'll spare you the long story. But it was similar where where I had to work it a little bit. Like who who should I be talking to? And then the first couple of sets of people that we talked with, uh, frankly, was very sober. It was very much like, gosh, it seems like that they're kind of stuck, like they're, they're in a quandary. Like they, they feel like that they should just build it themselves and not really partner with us in some way. And how much do we put ourselves at risk continuing to talk with them? It was one of those. And I'm usually pretty earnest. I'm like, well, and, and cocky at the same time. I'm earnest <laughs> about that you're negotiating in good faith, that you're not going to steal my ideas in this conversation. But I'm, I'm cocky in the sense that I also know that we've built it. You have it. So you guys have to go from a standing start. And that's really hard to do. So, uh, but at the end of the day, it was uh, uh, the, over the course of probably 18 months, the conversations got progressively more concrete. Uh, there was a changing of the guard at one point, uh, which I think <coughs> even helped the conversation move forward faster. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just to yeah. uh, go back to your point about luck, are there things that you do or have done to increase your I would say I would say one thing, and that's just keeping your mind open to uh, uh, sort of leave no stone unturned. Network, right? Like 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 the bumping into my former colleague at that uh, uh, place for brunch was just 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 kind of just remembering people and remembering where she went, and then being open to like you know going up to her and, and, and she was sitting there with all her. You know, a girlfriend. There was like a table of like six or seven women, and I, you know, I sort of like, should I go up and interrupt? And so, um, and just being open to. to Were that, you single then? I think I was. <laughs> so, uh, and um, uh, and, but yeah, that that that's uh, I think important. How how do you square that away with <coughs> the idea that you should be focusing on on your product and building your product uh, rather than say networking? Uh, great question. Um, well, number one, I do believe that you have to have something good there. I think I think your product has to be solid and great. So that is your number one priority. But I do think that the more that you, the more confidence that you have in your product being, you know what? I, I believe this. This is the world needs this. Or Google or Amazon. They, 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 this would add massive value. I see them struggling in this area, and this would just plug in and be great. Uh, then at that point, you do. I think that you have to spend about. 25, 35 percent of your time uh, doing a little bit more of that, um, getting out there and putting yourself, ex you know, get making your, yourself exposed to the opportunities. And what do you miss most of the picnic days? I miss the team and the culture, and I think it was a little bit of a there were, the picnic was really an interesting test tube uh, in a way. It was a, it was a test of a lot of things, and one of the things that I think we tested was how, one of the things I really deeply respect about uh, my uh, ex-business partners, Mike and Darren, was that we've all, we had all, all three of us had kind of gone through the ringer and had good experiences and bad experiences. So we became very thoughtful about like, well, what, what kinds of, 
why are some teams really well functioning and the culture is great and everybody has fun and they love coming to work? And, and not that we, we didn't write a spec about this, but we, we all sort of, all three of us intuited that, that if you kind of hire the right type of engineer with the right temperament, you know, this guy's great and takes pride in his or her work, but isn't super uptight about stuff. And is it going to get on somebody else's case if they if they checked in something that, that needed to be you know uh, checked again? So so we so we, we started looking for, we pro, we looked for a certain type of employee, and and, you know, and and I think we were pretty really good about that. And so consequently, that culture every every year I made a yearbook and I handed it out to people at the company party. It was actually a company picnic. It was the picnic. So, uh, uh, but, but, but every year I would hand out this hardbound uh, yearbook that captured all of these funny moments. It could have been something, the, some, something funny or goofy that somebody did, or, or a, a stupid, you know, goofy piece of artwork that somebody set <coughs> on the company fridge, and we took a picture of it. It could be, or, or a, a really great milestone. So, you know, somebody had a baby, and we would, you know, sort of commemorate that event. And and, uh, uh, and to this day, I look back at. Those yearbooks, and, and that, that's what I miss. It was, it was God, that was a great crew, and and I, I don't, you know, hopefully I can replicate it again. And what do you miss the least? There were really very few things. Um, very few things. Uh, very. I, I really loved almost all of it. Yeah. And then how many employees did you have? What was it? Twenty-three. I think it went, if you, and it maybe there were maybe if you count interns, maybe a yeah, little so bit you, more, something like 25. Close with every, you knew. Yeah, you knew everyone. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and uh, what to you is more, more important, team or product? Team. Team. Both from a, the standpoint of, 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 of what sort of floats your boat every morning when you come into work, uh, but also from the standpoint of I, I don't think you can have the right product unless you have the right team. So that's the high order bit. Is get really, really, get a really awesome team, and pivot the heck out of your product. It's a, you know you're you're gonna be wrong probably. You know first, here's your first idea, and I know that you have to. Your first idea has to be sound really, and so you can recruit the people. But, but if you have an awesome team, uh, uh, you know if your idea isn't panning out, just pivot, and, um, and you know an awesome team will do great. Yeah. Uh, what was your question? Yeah. I was gonna ask you about. You kind of talked about the intersection. And, uh, the ideas coming together and then running into your ex uh, colleague, right? That made the introduction to get going, I guess, with people. So you kind of answered the question. Okay. But also, <clears throat> as you discovered this too, what, what was for marketing channels, um, what was the best, what was the most effective for you guys yeah. at that time yeah. in just making this thing just explode? Yeah. After you I, got that initial right. introduction. Right. Yeah, I, I would say the number one thing, um, as much as I, I, I expended a lot of energy on the things that are very publicly known, like, you know, uh, you know, flew to Washington, D.C. to meet with Walt Mossberg, uh, and then he wrote about us, you know, that Sunday. You know, that, that's usually, like, a big deal. Or I remember Mike Arrington of TechCrunch calling me on my cell phone. I left it on my desk because I went to the men's room. I came back, you know, and I'm calling him back, and I'm literally, and then, and then as I'm, as his phone is ringing, uh, uh, one of the guys in the office is like, oh, the, he posted it already, you know, and then, you know, and it's anyway. As much as I think that the, the, the publicly known things are important, as it turns out, those are less important. The number one thing that really moved the needle for us in terms of users and uh, ongoing traffic and future partnerships. Um, was tapping into an audience of, for us, a very highly resonant audience of mommy bloggers. So after the first nine months or so, nine months or a year, it was very clear to us that the user base was 85% female. And it was a type of, certain type of female that was, um, like you could just read like what in the, in the blogosphere, it, the type of uh, woman who was tech savvy and a mommy uh, that was uh, a young mom um, uh, who, who was out there using picnic just to trick out her photos. And it's Halloween, and here's like you know. So 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 then we're like, okay, then then let's. It, it really isn't about the, all the cool dudes down in Silicon Valley. Like you know, when, when you when you hear about uh, you know every every startup that's launched in the valley, it's you, you picture that guy that, that they hope is their user, right? Um, so we started going to. Um, 
conferences like blog her or like there was like a foodie conference that we went there were, there were things like that that where it was just like um, and by the way if you're a single guy these are the places to go also. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 95 percent the only men walking around are guys like me trying to hot you know their product their startup but uh, but all of the uh, uh, but these are really um, uh, amazing environments where these women converge and they talk about uh, the stuff that's important to them in a way that's uh, 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 very substantive and cool and uh, not like a lot of the conferences that you know uh, that I would go to you know E3 or something and uh, so uh, so that was really good we started going to those and we and you would immediately see that traction you'd like meet a bunch of people or you, we had a booth like a very small booth that we paid nothing for I think the entrance at the time it was like maybe 500 bucks or something. We got out there with a banquet table, draped something that didn't even look as good as this over the front of it. I stood there with my business cards and a couple of laptops. I think I, you know, dragged uh, uh, someone and else with me. Yeah, and, 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 and it would just we just exchange business cards with a lot of these mommy bloggers um, who love the product, and um, uh, and then they would blog about it. And each person might have. One or two thousand followers, some of them bigger, uh, and that that really got the uh, user base up. So I highly recommend that. If that, if it, whatever it is for your product, find 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 that group. Uh, what do you? What are the biggest challenges today for finding the people to start? Finding the what? Yeah, biggest what are, challenges. What are the today? biggest challenges today for finding the people to start? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, these are all great questions. I think it's glass half full and half empty. The half full one perspective is actually I find it a little easier to recruit people now uh, than before. Well, if you factor out that maybe people know that I've done it a few times, if you, even if you if you account if somehow you can account for extracting that out of the equation, I think the fact of the matter is is that it's kind of cool and sexy to do startups now. It's like people. That the, the entre to be an entrepreneur is like the thing that now people aspire to be, you know, whereas when I started, it's like, I was telling you about my mom, like my mom, what? Entrepreneur what? What are you doing? Why can't you get a real job? You know? so, so, but now it's not like that. People kind of get like, you know, that's cool. So I think it's easier to pull people out of whatever uh, non-entrepreneurial endeavors that they're doing. Um, so that's a glass half full. Uh, the ha half empty, is probably in the in the specific case of engineers and UX designers, um, salaries. Good lord, some of these companies are paying a lot of money for. I mean, when when I started at, I'm just going to tell you how old I am. When I started at Microsoft, I was what was called a level eleven program manager, and, and you know back when they had fifty, like Bill G was a level fifteen. I was a level eleven. Like a receptionist was like a level nine, right? <laughs> And so I, I think my start, I think I made I, I just $40,000 a year was my salary. Now, I think the average, and, and they've, they, they've made it so that engineers, product managers, and designers are all kind of the same. Like, like kind of the average number to, to pull somebody away from like a Google, I mean, you're, it's going to, I mean, those guys are making 175 185 on up, plus they get all the food they can eat, <laughs> you know, uh, the best, best uh, health. You know benefits. Uh, yeah, so that's a big. That's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. when you compete against the big guys. When you compete against the big guys. Yeah. Um, so what do you think? What do you think there are? Why do you think there's so many people starting companies? Is it because of fame? Is it because of money? Is it because of the they've got an idea they just have to get out? What do you think is the, the top reason that people are starting a company? Because you you said it yourself. Yeah. It's it's kind of cool. Yeah. To start a company. It's very cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I, what's that? Especially when somebody fails, I want to know why people keep doing it. Right, right. I, have a, I, have, I, have a, I think I have an answer. Well, first of all, you, you should you should all answer that uh, instead answer. of me. But I, I think there's something about owning your own destiny that is noble and empowering. And 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 I explain this every you know sometimes what, you know when I do a startup every sort of one that I do. Uh, for whatever, usually I'm the one who's sort of done it before, and then and then and then I kind of coach the others, you know, to be like, hey, like with GeekWire, it's, it's, a, it's a, John and Todd are awesome reporters, right? That's what they know. But like the stuff that I tell them about is like, hey, guess what? If 
we're set up as an S corp. Here's the way that income can pass through, and here's the way that we could be they tax really efficient. They care about that. Yeah, right, right. You know, yeah, they do actually. Yeah. So, but my point is that it, it's like, and then they're like, oh my god, like instead of like being an employee of uh, uh, you know big company, um, I actually have a lot more control. There's a lot more levers over how I just the very simple fact of how my income is realized. Uh, and that's the even kind of stupid example, but it's even just owning your own destiny in terms of the kinds of business partnerships you want to strike. Or just, hey, what are, what are our site's brand values? What do we want people to think when they think GeekWire? Should they even, what's the name of this site? Right? Those are things that you don't get to do when you're an employee in a big company. So I think there's that sense of, of being your own boss, owning your own destiny, taking charge. Uh, in my case, also, it was, it was uh, frankly, proving that I wasn't a fluke. You know, there's a generation of us that grew up kind of at Microsoft. I started at Microsoft in 92. Even as a level 11, you know, entry-level program manager, I was given enough stock options that it became meaningful. And you want to know, and then, you know, lost a lot of it with it, you know, in, the, in economic downturn. So, but, you, but, you, but you still want to know that, that you're not a fluke, that you didn't ride on the coattails of, of Microsoft stock, but you didn't, in my case, I was in the applications group, that I didn't ride on the coattails of the systems, you know, Windows guys, right, that those guys are really the heartland and, you know, making a ton of money for a company. So, so, so in my case, it was also just proving that, 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 that you could do it. Yeah. So, what do you think the difference, what's the difference to you, in your opinion, between here and Silicon Valley and starting a company? Right. Great I mean, question. Just both good and bad. Yeah, good and bad. Yeah, I'll so hold up the mirror to Seattle. Yeah, so, so I, I, I think I think the good stuff is the big, one of the biggest differences is that Seattle is much more collegial as an environment. I feel like the people are much more collaborative. You know, your your past speakers at this event and your future speakers that you uh, enumerated. I'm like, I know all those guys. We we hang out. You know, I just asked Rand uh, a question the other day about SEO. You know, and he helped. There's no. If people aren't competitive in, in that uh, um, uh, sort of destructive way. Um, so I like that about um, But one of the other differences is um, we're a little more conservative here, all around, in terms of conservative in terms of the ideas we want to launch as entrepreneurs, and conservative in terms of if, 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 if you're an angel or you're a VC, conservative in terms of the kinds of um, uh, startups you want to support. And so the Bay Area index is much more liberally, if you will. Like, like you can, I mean, the extreme case is that you can be a company like Color and on a, on a really <laughs> awesome PowerPoint and a charismatic CEO raise, I don't even know what it was, 41, like, million. 41 million on a PowerPoint. So that's the, that's the extreme. But, there, but there's, you know, without going to that extreme, there's a lot of, there's a great zone that's actually really sweet for entrepreneurs, which is that there are a lot, there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of, uh, institutional money or angel money that's willing to believe in you if they think your idea is good. And I think it's just a little harder up here for, for folks. Um, so th that's another difference. Um, this is neither here nor there. I think entrepreneurs up here tend to be a little older. They tend to be people who are, you know what, I'm done with my 10, 12 years at Microsoft or Amazon. I'm ready to move on. There, it's like, oh, I just graduated from Stanford. Of course I'm going to do a startup. You know? so. <laughs> Why do you think, um, or, or, no, let's just back here. What do you think that, if you were to start a company today, yeah. another company, uh, what would you look for in a partner, founder, slash guy to help start the company? What would you look for in that girl or guy? What yeah. would, be the, what would yeah. be the keys to that? Yeah, and I would admit that what I look for may not be the same as what, um, so, so, but what I would look for is um, shared values, and by that I mean um, I don't mean that like, you know if I'm a Democrat the person can't be a Republican. I don't mean that. In fact, I, I love the I, I love that difference. In, in, uh, right. Um, so, but but uh, what I mean is um, you have this sort of you have this this sort of the same values around money and a time value of money, right? You're starting out. You know, an employee walks in, or maybe he, your, your business partner walks in. I, I need a new monitor. Do you go? Do you go on Craigslist and get one for a used one for 120 bucks, 
or do you go to Costco and pay uh, um, you know three or four hundred dollars for the brand new one that's larger, whatever? So those kinds of I mean, that's a kind of a dumb example, but those things uh, become more and more important down the road. But they're actually very good indicators. That's right. Extremely yeah, indicators. yeah, right. You know, we're kind of bursting at the seams. Should we? We're only paying fifteen hundred a month rent. Should we now go to this place that's going to cost us four grand a month rent? We can afford it, but we don't really have to do it. You know, what do you do, right? Or do you rather put that money into another player? So those shared values is very important. So it could be around money. It could be around, oh, it could be around how you hire. You know, do you value personal loyalty? Or do you value just pure, somebody could be, their intellectual horsepower is amazing, an employee. But they're really a jerk to work with. Do you keep them around? Right? So those are things that, as, as business partners, you have to agree on. And, uh, and maybe you don't agree. So, so that's another uh, key one. Um, another key partner attribute might be, um, um, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, but uh, that, that there's not a great delta in terms of your work ethic. If you are someone who is, there's all, I would say this, there's always somebody in any founder group, uh, whether it's two person or three or five, there's always somebody who's the long step. There's always somebody who makes all the other guys feel kind of guilty about like, he's working on Saturday. He's working on Saturday, I know. <laughs> he owns just as much of the company as I do. I, can't, I guess I can't get on email and <laughs> figure out some point that I had value. There's always, uh, it's true. Yeah, and so, yeah. so I think, uh, there, so that's not a, you know, the small children will not die if you end up with one guy who's the outlier. Uh, but but I think it's, it's nicer when everybody's sort of in agreement. And I've been in situations where we had to sort of sit down with the outlier person and be like, can you mellow out? You're making us feel bad. And plus, I think your wife wants to see you. So, <laughs> so that's okay. Yeah. So. so I guess those things. Yeah, that's great. Um. Do you, are the same things true for outside advisors? Self-serving question. Uh -huh. way, right? I mean, do you look for the same attributes in I, lawyers? I, yeah, I do. Actually, I do. Yeah, I, I look for, well, I, I also look for, uh, this one is also going to sound a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but uh, I also look for whether we're sort of at the same place in life. Uh, I'm not sure, I think I think it's a carryover from, I don't know, maybe it was like when I first started, you know, when I was kind of, I had a little bit of money to, to invest and I was looking for like a financial advisor type of person. It just kind of dawned on me, like, oh my gosh, if, I'm, if, if somebody's sort of like maybe in the same phase of life as me, but of just a few years ahead where they have more experience, then, then that person's going to be able to relate to my problems. And so in terms of uh, attorneys or CPAs or, or even my choice of PR firm, I tend to look for someone that's, like if, if they run their own PR firm or if they're a partner in their own law firm, I, t I tend to look for somebody that's got about the same amount of small business, startup business experience as, as I do, so that they can kind of, you know, that's appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Hope that answers your question. So, so tell me, what do you think about, um, I've had a number of conversations about this, is valuations. Mm -hmm. So give me your, your two cents on, do you think valuations are it should be. Do you think valuations are different than that? Tell oh, you mean oh, you mean right now? I'm saying today, or today, today uh -huh. August or October uh -huh. 30th. Yeah. Are valuations in in the startup world? Mm -hmm. Are they where they should be in your opinion? The short answer is yes, because if you look, well, it, it's it, this this is this is a very difficult question to answer because. Um, if you take stock of the aforementioned Instagram, was that worth a billion dollars to Facebook? You know, and, and all of you, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys all know this. I mean, there's multiple ways that you you sort of there's different zones that as a as a, as a startup you want to be at, and then and then like depending on which zone you're in, that might determine kind of you know, the zones meaning like are you you know uh, uh, are you just in the do you have strategic? Are you a great strategic fit, you know, for for the buyer? Uh, are you, do you are you are you sort of a lifestyle business that's been kicking out a lot of money, and so you can express there's there's this just monetary kind of P and L value to the buyer, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, I would say that if you are highly strategic like that to a Facebook, I think a billion dollars is probably about right. You know, that's a 
that's over time, I bet you Facebook would extract more than a billion dollars of, of value from that acquisition. It's not just the town. It's not just the, uh, that was the other zone, by the way, the town. Uh, it's not just the, uh, the whatever, I don't even know if Instagram makes any money. Do you, no, do you guys know? No. They never, did they ever no. charge for anything? No. no. I don't think they did. Right. So they're not. No, right, right. right. But but uh, but but it's the fact that Facebook now has the best of breed funnel in on mobile devices as it relates to their core crown jewels. Photos. Facebook is is all about photos. Is the biggest photo sharing site in the world. That's what they really are. So they can't seed that mobile ground and sea changes towards. Those photos are not coming in. They're not getting uploaded from, you know, uh, somebody's laptop. They're coming in from a mobile device. Mobile yeah. device. They can't see that ground. For them to pay a billion dollars for that, yeah. yeah. So that's my long-winded way of saying uh, uh, we can probably both find examples of, of, both, of sides. both sides. Uh, but um, yeah, I would say generally, probably the valuations are where they need to be. And do you think valuations are higher in Seattle versus? I mean. But do you think yeah. valuations are equal Seattle Silicon Valley? I do not. No. Yeah, I, 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 I do think that you get a nice bump up uh, if you're in Silicon Valley. And I think it's um, uh, a number of factors. You know, yeah, it's so, just, so if yeah. you and I went down and started a company, we started a company today here in Seattle, mm -hmm. six months, whatever, and we go down there and do the same thing six months, the valuation in Silicon Valley, in your opinion, would be higher. Same two people. Same concept, but different <clears throat> landscape. Different landscape. You're going to have different net networks of people that are your support group that are helping you out. You're going to have uh, a different type, most likely a different type of investment banker. Uh, uh, you're going to have a different kind of advisory board. Uh, it's it's almost, I would argue it's probably, frankly, easier. No disrespect to my colleagues in, in the Valley, but it's easier to put your company in an auction scenario if you're down in the Valley. Here, you have to work harder to put your company in an auction scenario, which obviously is the, is the, is the key driver of price, so, uh, uh, um, or a key driver of price. So, so uh, I, I would say that that's a true statement. That, that, um, yeah. um, being an entrepreneur, this is, uh, here's some questions that people sent me in the, in the audience. Uh, actually, maybe some of them aren't in the audience, but sent me questions either way. Uh, so being entrepreneurial, you're, you're basically most of your career. Why? Why did you go to work at Google? Because obviously you were yeah, purchased by Google. Yeah. You have, I'm sure there's money laying on the table. Yeah, but yeah, some, yeah. yeah. But that wasn't the, yeah, it was, um, I was, you know, honestly wanting to be, to add value. And again, it was another test. Um, when you, when you see that, so I was actually at Google twice, right? And both times I was blown away, about that. and more, much more so the second time because I was older, precisely because I was just older. And but I was blown away by how freaking smart these kids were. I mean, these people are—they really—I will hand it to them. They're, they uh, we thought at Microsoft back in the early '90s when we were all you know 24, 25 years old at Microsoft. We thought we were like the smartest people. Uh, 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 you know, just wow, you know, what a great company and all that stuff. And we were probably way too arrogant, by the way. Back then, um, still are um, some of us. And 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 but Google, they, they deserve every accolade. I mean, this is a company that freaking creates a car that drives itself, right? This is a company that does amazing things. And I think, with all that said about uh, Larry Page, uh, his 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 leadership style as a CEO, uh, you know, he he does talk about. Betting big, going big, think big uh, ideas, and and I think that's really great. And so uh, my answer to your question, Michael, is about you know wanting to um, operate and and operate well in that environment is is you know I figured I would learn a lot from being there. Being uh, proved that you could operate well. Yeah, yeah, and, and really just learning a lot. Just my gosh, you know how do you how do you how do you how do you approach solving this kind of how long before you start another company? Well, if you don't, if you, you don't count Decoy, right? And then, uh, well, no, uh, yeah, I'm saying, something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think, uh, as soon as I get my act together. <laughs> so, uh, I'm definitely investing and advising a lot of companies right now. Uh, I, I've enjoyed playing uh, the deal lead 
on a couple of, we're more than a couple of companies, but, but Visify down in Portland is a fantastic uh, company, and, and I learned a lot being um, a deal leader, being an angel, sort of leading around and corralling herding cats, you know, uh, 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 setting the deal terms, and just learning a lot about that stuff, and the dynamics of why this person, uh, who's a known famous angel in town, would invest in something, and versus this person, why that person doesn't invest well, in it. Because he's in it. Yeah, yeah, it's a, learning all about that stuff, and uh, so that, that's been a lot of fun, um, and, uh, and advising uh, others, uh, other companies. So, fun. so, so, so can, yeah. can we, can so, we so, have a round of applause yeah. for an authentic, uh -huh. second-generation angel investor <laughs> in Seattle, right? <laughs> 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 This is one of the things, one of the most powerful things that the Valley has that we do not, mm. is second generation angel investors. Oh yeah, second generation, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Does everyone understand what he's, yeah. can't just, what, second generation has made their money. Putting your money where you're, right? Been a, been a, yeah. Made, yeah. made your money as a starter. Through some you started accidents. a company, yeah. you, you grew a company. You sold the company, the you made your money, yeah. and then you then you're going back and you're investing into the community. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's In right. the valley, that happens all the time. That happens all the time. Yeah. yeah. Dave McClure and yeah. all those guys. Yeah. So yeah. questions, feel free. Yeah, I have a question. You mentioned uh, the requirement. We all know the requirement. How busy are you there? Are you actually working there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm there. Sure, right? uh, to, you know, uh, two, three days a week. Uh, I'm there actually sitting in the GeekWire offices with uh, John and Todd and uh, Rebecca and Emily and, and uh, uh, Taylor. So uh, that, that that's a lot of fun. That, that, again, is a whole different area. And I don't, by the way, uh, um, I don't influence editorial uh, being on the business side. But when it's non-editorial, when it's like, you know, hey, um, um, uh, 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 how should we redesign a site? So that that's a little bit more fun for our users, or should we? You know, one of the things that I want to do is the startup construction kit, right? Which is like a resource center mm -hmm. that you go to on GeekWire, and say you just don't even know how to be. Should I be a? Should I be a, 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 a you know a Chapter S or an LLC or C Corp or what? What you can read about that, or maybe you know how do I get started? Who who, who are the lawyers in town that I could, could, could go to, uh, uh, to to help me incorporate the company? Or how do I go about hiring a UX designer or an engineer? Uh, what are the challenges there? And so so uh, so problem solving there and figuring out those kinds of new feature ideas, uh, I, I really enjoy doing. So, okay. this is all about that one. Why would you do a press uh, media company? Yeah, when media companies are making media money. Right. Um, so <laughs> what? Well, yeah. uh, well, I didn't know that they were making it. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I think there's a, here's what I think. I think there's a chance for media companies to be something else. And a lot of us are, we're, and we're trying, it's just a matter of figuring out what that something else is. So if you, I think at every epoch, there is this uh, a dilemma that people face where it's like, do I, do I just continue with the tried and true? Or is it an opportunity to reboot? You know, Picnic was a reboot of the whole way that we thought about photo editing. When John and Todd told me that they were considering leaving the Patriot Sound Business Journal, leaving Tech Flash, I didn't waste it. I, I was like, okay, it's a, that's a that's going to be a re there's this, so again it's a, a shift. change. It's going to be a shift. You know, uh, I, I don't. You know, I hear all the time. You know, Seattle PI what happened, and, and Seattle Times is under a lot of you know, there's a big kerfuffle recently. I think there is something to be said of print media being. Um, going away, and there's this new open field, which is digital media, and how do we deliver that in a way uh, uh, that is uh, going to be really compelling long term? And I think figuring out that problem, I wanted to be in a in a position to be able to figure that out. So that's why I did it, knowing that it wasn't going to be this you know wildly profitable thing right off the bat. And we're doing well, by the way. We're actually uh, 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 revenue positive and. And uh, page is growing month after month after month, and we're hiring, and so it's uh, it's cool. It's yeah. I just to comment on that, though. I think I think tech focused media is a critical leg in the in the tech startup community. And you've got you've got that in space in the Bay Area, and you think we need that here? Mm -hmm. we, we need that. Whether it makes money or not, if there's somebody, if there's somebody can yeah. you know, at least carry it. 
Right. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I think it's important for us to have a voice here in Seattle to be to be for there to be people like John Cook and Todd Bishop to write about you know uh, what's going on up here and have this regional focus. I think it's really important that for for Seattle to be able to be considered a tech center, I think you have to have a tech voice. Yeah. Right. Instead of just yeah tech crunch and venture beat. Um, we have a startup, and we have, we're all techies, and we love design, and so I started looking at talking to you. Oh, um, thanks for coming to that. Yeah, yeah so you know, after looking at about 100 Dribble portfolios and the rest, uh -huh. we found a, a freelance guy that we love, but we'd like to hire a full-time person. I'm curious where you would look to find great design talent. Right. Um, you know, I don't there, are, there are a couple of places I would well, Tapping into your network of, of people that work at big companies is, is definitely one. And, and my aforementioned uh, uh, one of my favorite bosses, uh, Lisa Bramble, she needs to cover her ears. Because she's now, uh, she runs HR at Microsoft, and she wouldn't want me talking about how, you know, everybody go poach from companies like Microsoft. But, but I do think that <laughs> network of you know, former colleagues hearing about somebody who's maybe they're a little unhappy where they are and they're thinking of leaving, that, that's, that's always been my number one way. The second way is, um, I do think that there is an amazing amount of talent that is coming out of some local programs here. So if you, I haven't, I haven't done this in a few years, but a few years ago I would actually have pretty good luck looking at places um, uh, just up the street from here, the Seattle Art Institute, and they actually would have, uh, you know, they've, they've done a really good job of kind of pivoting and having more digital uh, uh, program, you know, where where the, 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 the graduates are pretty decent. Uh, at the things that you need them to do, and so so getting, getting kind of plugged into those uh, portfolio reviews and things like that um, is is and a nice type of uh, design. It's two up on Capitol Hill. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Cornish. Cornish. Yeah, yes. Cornish. Cornish. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and also one one other thing that I would offer is that um, there are a number of. We're really lucky in Seattle now because in recent years there are a number of um, really, really top-notch design firms that have both the sort of information architecture, the behavior design, behavioral design, and the uh, aesthetic design. Um, uh, they, they may have a stable of 20 to 25 designers, and you can kind of, you can just go and kind of hire them for like a month, and uh, and they'll do great work for you. Um, that could be a way to sort of get stuff up and running quickly. It's amazing how good they are, uh, and, and sometimes they've poached from the best and the brightest from some of the big companies. And which firms do you like? Um, the Artifact Group is really excellent. Um, uh, 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 there's Jackson Fish Market. There's Bill Flora's. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of his firm, uh, uh, but he, he just started it about probably six months ago. Um, I'm forgetting add, somebody. Yeah, I just so. want to add something is that Seattle has a really um, well um, educated AIGA chapter. It's the American Institute of Graphic Artists. And they have annual meetings here. In fact, you know, like the whole country will come here. And a lot of people at Microsoft who are Microsoft graphic artists belong to that. And it's a place where you would find um, um, the ability to advertise or see people's portfolios there. And also, I think just speaking from experience from people that I've worked with before, um, you can get a lot of people there who are spinning out of, say, Microsoft or other companies, big companies like this, too, who um, really want the flexibility, that they need to have flexibility to be away from 9 to 5, and I'm thinking mostly of parents and people who need to pick up and things like that, and that are really looking for breaking that corporate and are really, really talented and, you know, you'd be really lucky to have, and it would be like, this would be the perfect thing for me, so. Right. That's a great right, point. Yeah. That's a great point. I, I, you have tapped into one of the hardest job functions to hire here for startups is, is really good UX designers. It's, yeah, we feel very lucky that we found this fantastic freelance yeah, guy. Uh, right, right. right. To get more that's right. Yeah, that, that's the thing that I hear a lot from my colleagues in the tech industry is that when I see them at, a, say, a GeekWire event, they will say, like, gosh, how do we get more UX designer types to come to these events so we can network with them? They don't, they're not looking for a job. Yeah, they're not looking for a job. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, totally. yeah, who is that really talented freelancer's name? <laughs> 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 We're all sharing. We're all sharing. <laughs> <laughs>
We're sharing many things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you say you're doing some investing, some you say what what are you looking for? What are you looking for in companies? What spaces do you think are are doing really well or could be doing really well really well in their future? Right. Um, so forgive me, I may not be too structured in how I talked about this tonight, but um, you catch me on a good day and I'm very structured. Uh, so so I think I have to believe that the founders uh, and the core team can go the distance. I, I, I think we touched on a number of things uh, uh, this evening that's about the challenges of doing a startup. It's, it's always hard. It's never easy. And so you, you, want, you want to look for the team that communicates well, you, get, you try to intuit that they already have values alignment, like what I was talking about, and, and that they're going to go the distance and not flake out on you in any way. So that's number one. Um, and I think that's more important than the concept itself. Um, I look for a concept where the universe of, of, of users uh, uh, is very large. You want to look for that large denominator, right, of, of possible people you can reach so that if you're only reaching 1% of that universe, 1% of that large denominator, uh, that's, that's still a very large number. Um, and that, so let me bookmark that for a second. What I don't get, what I don't care about, which some people, other people care about, is that the concept is unique, or that it's the first of its kind, or that it's really clever? Like sometimes there's some clever insight, and and you're like, okay, eleven people. Will, I mean, that's yeah, that's damn clever. <laughs> eleven people will use that. So 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 I think uh, uh, you some things seem um, they can be really distracting in that process. That they actually don't matter as much as you know. I don't believe in necessarily first mover advantage. Uh, I think it's uh, he or she who happens to hang in there the longest and does it the most well, that's the one that wins. Well, I, I agree, Apple was hardly the first person to make a tablet, right? Yeah. Right, that's right, well, exactly. Was the first year. First year. Right. Right. right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The surface is surface. Uh, uh, yeah. So hi, I'm Brittany, and um, I don't know if you remember me, but if you were one of the judges at the Startup Weekend for Mom Go Local. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yes, that was a fun event. Yeah, yeah that was cool. Um, yeah, very good. So yeah. we're still trying to pursue that. And, yeah, that's um, great. No, that was a cool concept. Yeah, and so uh, my question to you, um, and the reason why I came is because I wanted to talk to you. But, uh, so we're, we're kind of in the process. We've got validation, and it's like slowly but surely, right? Because we're all working full time, yes. but mm -hmm. doing it on the side. But, yeah. um, so we're coming up with a landing page, trying to first collect like emails, location. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if this is the right strategy, but. Um, then comes, you know, actually building something that people can use and starting to mm -hmm. actually get people interested in targeting, marketing, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So I'm trying to figure out first if I should get like an advisor or someone like, you know, to mentor me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, that's my question. Is that kind of a good next step or what is it? Yeah, because we're so early on in the stage of validation mm -hmm. and like trying to build something. Yeah. Um, so that's. I think that is a good next step. If you're, not, of course, I don't understand exactly what what that comes at the expense of. You know, time spent trying to find a mentor or, or putting together an advisory team. Um, uh, you know, what would you be dropping on the floor if you were doing that? But but without knowing that, I think it's a fantastic idea. For if I remember, you guys. Uh, yeah. So basically, allow local moms in their neighborhood to easily um, create place moms. Love it. Yeah, exactly. I actually was more bullish on this idea for. Uh, yeah, I, I was. I, I actually love you guys' this idea. Um, and I, we have this problem uh, in, in my house. Yeah. Um, I think it's really good to put together an advisory board because um, it's, it's it's not very costly. To you. you know, uh, there's some token. If you like them, you really you, you are appreciative. You know, there's a little bit of you know some some uh, uh, stock that maybe you can you know give uh, uh, and and you know maybe if you have a a great exit uh, in a few years that, that, that what they got was enough to buy a new car. You know, that along those lines. You know, think about it at that scale. That's what that's what advisory board members would expect. And I think that putting together one that you feel like that you can meet with uh, on a regular rhythm will be a forcing function for you to always be ready to have some pointed questions to ask of. Is it too early for that, though? Or is no. Okay, so I don't think it's too early. And, but you'd be surprised. Speaking of the Valley, a lot of companies sort of it's almost like this, um, uh, what do you call it, a statusy thing that if they can put together a really kick-ass advisory board, you know, before they even like, like practically right at about the time that they have the PowerPoint, that's yeah. that's like you know that, that gives them. <laughs> 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 Your traction, I think, at Picnic is what you said, where all of a sudden you've got this like blog and people start writing about it, and all yeah. of a sudden you kind of have the tipping, tipping point. 
Yes. Uh -huh. it did. So and that's kind of what your story was, but like I don't know if the advisory board would help with that, but that's kind of what I'm looking for. Is it, it would not. Kind of point where I need some sort of tipping point where I need enough traction to actually start like saying, okay, I want to start building this, you know? Yeah, what, it, what the advisory board wouldn't get you that traffic okay. traction directly, but what it would do is it would, I, I do think it's important to sort of not be in a, in a, in a vacuum about, you know, so I, I, do, I do think that's the hardest thing to do, is if you are a startup founder or a startup CEO, it is the loneliest job, and every day there are 10 things that will make you feel like, am I even doing this right? I feel like I'm just winging it all the time. Like this, you know, and, and, there, and there are people who are eager to, maybe it's your business partners, that will point out, like, no, you told them you know, you know, That's not the way that you talk to the vice president of Apple. Uh, so, uh, so, so I think having that uh, advisory board, uh, it's, it's pretty cheap to put together. You don't, you don't, you're not paying them. Maybe you agree to meet every quarter. You take them out to lunch. Or if you have a law firm that you're working with, you know, if you're working with Graham and Dunn, you're, you're, you're meeting here uh, once a quarter in a conference room here. So, you know, yeah. Okay. I hope so, I've answered your question. Yeah. We can talk some more. Too. Yeah. So with Picnic out the gates, were you self-funded or did you go out the VC money right up? Yeah, well, so I used to talk about how we were self-funded. And somebody corrected me and said, no, you guys are really self-angel. So we, 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 we never raised outside <coughs> money. It was the three of us putting in money. Yeah. And if I had had, um, you'd ask me what one of the biggest challenges were, was, and I chose to focus on something pretty universal, which was um, conflict resolution amongst the partnership group. But, but really, the second challenge, second biggest challenge, was the, were those dark times when you're the guy covering me. It's your turn. <clears throat> it's your, your yeah, your, or yeah, it's like it's like okay, we've got. I think it was right around when we had like 12 employees when we were about that big, and and. I hope I'm not getting this number wrong. Uh, uh, forgive me if you if you guys are better at math tonight than I am. And, and, uh, but but it was like I think payroll was I want to say it was like maybe sixty grand a month or something. And I had a, you know twenty grand every month that I write a check. You know three of us each write twenty grand, right? And it was like always every month this moment. You know we'd look at each other beforehand. It was like, we got to make the deposits. <laughs> So that, that was, it, 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 that's actually, I have to let me go back a step. It's, it's, that's, fun, that's part, par for the course if you're self-funded. Um, but it's when it goes, it's been like that for 18 months or two years. And you know that there's a point in time when, when, when your income will exceed your expenses. But you may have a disagree. You may have a disagreement, or you, there may be a sufficient ambiguity about the business, and um, and that's when it exacerbates the stressfulness of that, right? Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But 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 I, you, maybe you were tracking us something. Uh, uh, no, that's a different question. Okay. Other questions, guys? We got a couple minutes. Coming out. I don't know that there's a better acid test though for uh, for. Investing in entrepreneurs yes. than that entrepreneur who has cut checks for paper. Skin of the game. Yeah, I mean, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, right. I think. Right, right. And I think that that also changes the culture of your company. I mean, not that you walk around, you're walking down the hall and go, I'm writing a check, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I, think, I, think, I, think, I think people appreciate, their employees appreciate, like, you know, they're, they're making sacrifices. And uh, and then hopefully, if you if, if you set it up right, you know the core folks who are not founders that they have a little piece, you know, they have maybe not a little, but a significant piece of the action. And so I think that there, for us, it was very heartening to see how people were really like you know, for people to understand like, um, um, uh, especially in two thousand eight when the world was falling apart financially, uh, to say hey, uh, yeah, I, I know that in years past, you know couple of you, whenever you've come in and you've really needed a raise because of some reason, uh, we've said yes, but this year, you know, or, or maybe some of us were going to have to take a bit of a haircut in terms of your take-home pay. People were like, understood, and because they understood that we were even uh, sacrificing even more, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question regarding the Picnic Capital Fund. Yeah. Uh, I have started in the Netherlands. Uh, and that's quite different than things are here. Yeah. One thing, we don't give out shares to people because it's legally 
difficult. I see. There, there are some issues there, so it's really hard to do. Uh -huh. I didn't have an advisory board proper. Mm -hmm. and, and so actually the question would be um, two-sided. Like, one, um, how would you go about um, getting advisors in your team if you're not ready or willing or able to be a chair? Perhaps you don't have a proper, like, um, limited company yet mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. uh, what you give, and also as, a, as an advisor to companies, what is the reason why you actually do the advising? And what is it that you like for it, and what would you like to get back? Right, I think I, those two questions are definitely very related. Uh, there have been times when I have just not been given anything, uh, and I have agreed to be an advisor, an advisor to be on the advisory board of a company, or to, or to commit to say yes. You know, once once you actually form your advisory board, it could be in six months that I that I'll be a part of it, um, uh, simply because I have enjoyed the interaction and the exchange with the co-founders. That I feel like that they're really there's something very good about what's happening there, and and I want us to keep tabs on it. So so my reasons for saying yes, even in lieu of, of getting something in return, getting a, a, a formal concrete monetary thing in return is uh, that I feel like I can learn from them, that I, that I believe in their mission, uh, you know, sort of in a similar way. I want to talk with you about your nonprofit because it sounds really great. Uh, I can't believe nobody else is doing it. You know, I think it's wonderful that you're doing it. So, so if you believe in, in that what they're doing really adds value, that the world needs it, um, then, then that, those would be reasons. Uh, so I wish I had some better answers for you in terms of, like, if you can't give them stock, what else can you give them? Um, you're giving your effort, right? That's what you're giving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe there's a way, maybe they have a startup where down the line there could be something synergistic. You know, it could be something like that uh, uh, that you can actually say, kind of pledge to the other person. Uh, but, but say, and just this is something else as an add on, uh, do you think uh, here in the US it is uh, a good thing? Give care that it is the right incentive. I think it is. I do think it's the right incentive. I think it's a, it is a good thing because um, uh, 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 then then uh, you're very much in alignment. They want to see you do so. Any question that you can have for your advisory board, and these are the questions that I've had for my advisory boards. Hey, is this a good deal <laughs> coming in from company X? You know, they want to buy us, or this company wants to partner with us. Should we spend time working <laughs> on that, or should we spend time investing in our mobile app? Right, so they're 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 incentive they're they're in a complete alignment with you if they own they have some ownership in your company. So, thank you. Yeah, you are. Well, guys, thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much for CIP, Jim. Thanks for coming by. Uh, thanks for Grandma Dunn for uh, helping host this event. And uh, great thanks for Jonathan Spazzano. Hey.